All right, well, let me start by welcoming everybody to the 2019 annual meeting of Brattleboro Community Television. Uh, I always have to begin with a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, restrooms are down the hall to the left, all the way at the end. There's a couple of restrooms there if anybody uh, needs to use that during the festivities that will be going through today. Um, I want to just take a minute before we start to introduce myself. I'm Chris Lenoir. I'm the president of the board here at Brattleboro Community Television. I want to acknowledge all the board members who are in the room with us today. Uh, and I'll start with Alex Beck because he's the vice president. Uh, then Jim Verzino is the treasurer currently. Thank you, Jim. We have Lynn Barrett over there. And we have Bob Gammon right here. Um, and I know at least a couple of board members, uh, I think, are watching the stream. Marty Cohn, if you're watching. Hi, Marty. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, Pauline Dean, our secretary, as well as Leah Goodman, uh, our absent. Jesse Kreitzer, I, I don't see him here yet either. Uh, so, oh, no, that's right. He's he's unavailable as well tonight. But uh, those are your, your board members right now. Is any Russ, were you a board member ever at any time? No, or Wendy? No? Okay, so I think everybody's present in the Calvary. And of course, the, the BCTV staff, uh, all the great folks who do all the great work uh, and what we are here to support today with Cor Trowbridge, uh, Nolan Edgar, Brian Bishaw, and Vlasta Popelka. Thank you all for everything that you do. Um, we had one board member who was standing for election. That was Alex Beck. Uh, polls are now closed, so hopefully everybody had a chance to vote either here in person today or online. Uh, that's been a nice thing the last couple of years that we've done this, uh, that we've we've had the votes online. Ian, there's still time for you to vote, though. We'll hold the polls for for Ian Keel to vote. Thanks for thanks for coming, Ian. Um, it's brand, it's live. <laughs> I'm calling people. I'm naming names, um, and I should also mention that. That we are streaming this on Facebook Live, so that is an opportunity for people to submit questions or comments as we go through the proceedings right now. Um, and I guess with that, I do want to turn it over. Oh, I do have a couple of things I need to say here. I did recognize the staff. I recognize one of the field producers. I do want to just mention by name uh, the other ones. Uh, is it Janice Shalou? Shalou, thank you. Um, Rich Melanson, uh, Frederick Noyes, Esler Oresti, Austin Rice, and Emily Richard. Thanks to all the great work that they do. I want to thank Brattleboro Savings and Loan, the Brattleboro Food Co-op, and the Brattleboro Retreat uh, for underwriting uh, this program. And um, also, oh, this is your part of the script. I'm, I'm just going over. I'm going to give you the whole state of the station here. Uh, so I guess now I'll turn it over to Cor since I'm going into her part of the script here. Cor Trowbridge, Executive Director. Okay, folks. <laughs> thanks so much chris uh let me just get into my uh little presentation here and thanks for uh watching on facebook if you are out there after all those newsletters i just can't imagine that you're not so hi everybody i'm core trowbridge executive director here at bctv and welcome to the annual members meeting uh, we call it the annual members meeting because we are a membership organization um, but this is an annual meeting that's welcome that that anyone is welcome to attend and it's basically our way of getting together for the year and going over the business of the organization um, what happened what didn't happen what were our goals did we meet them um, and also to elect um, board of directors and um, so this is a sort of a procedural meeting that we make as fun as possible and we have video and um, but it's, it's important for us as a nonprofit to follow all of our rules and make sure we check all the boxes every year. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, as Chris was mentioning, we do have a staff of full-timers plus some part-time people. Um, and um, our full-time people are me and Vlasta Popelka, operations manager back in the back, Nolan Edgar, who is our content manager, Brian Bashaw, who is our... Um, production manager, and then our field producers are Austin Rice, Janice Shalou, M. Richards, Rich Melanson, and missing from photo, Ian Keel, oops, who's here in the audience, Frederick Noyes, and Esler Areste. And then in the corner, we have our IT guy, who we also call the fifth beetle, Tom Woodbury. <laughs> 
we do have underwriters um, that have been very loyal to us over the years, and this is uh, something we'll be talking about going on, the Brattleboro Savings and Loan, the Food Co-op, and the Brattleboro Retreat. And uh, so what is it that happened this year? That's what I'm here to talk about. Um, this year, we all heard about it in the news, and um, last year I spent a lot of time talking about Facebook Live and our engagement and views and content, and this year I'm calling the year of the threat <laughs> in the nicest way possible. Um, we, uh, we really got them on all levels, uh, federal, state, and local. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through them one by one and talk about which ones were realized, what do we know now about where they each stand and how, if any way, have we responded to those? Um, we met as an organization in June at a meeting called Future Proofing BCTV, and I put up this slide that kind of gave you a bunch of threats on the side, um, and I'm going to take you through those and update you on that. Uh, the first one was a decline in cable revenues Oh, which was for the first time um, in, uh, in many years, happened last year. And as you can see from the second one, the one at the end, line at the end, which is the current year we just had, it was the same kind of year. There was an accounting change allowed um, uh, for Comcast, which made our revenues decline, and also there was a trend of cord cutting that finally reached us. So that's something that happened and created a decline of about $20,000. There was a Supreme Court case. <laughs> Public access was not only in the news in terms of the FCC, but also in the Supreme Court. The situation was there was a producer banned from submitting content to Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And um, BCTV also has policies um, that would limit a producer's right to use the facilities but not to ban them from the channel. So this was in public access world, kind of a very strong move to say you can't even submit to the channel. Um, so that's why the producer took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the argument was whether, came down to whether Manhattan Neighborhood Network is a public forum, just a straight public forum with guaranteed free speech no matter what or whether it's a nonprofit that has policies that it can enforce. And uh, the frightening thing for us was that one of the um, justices raised a side question of whether carriage of PEG programming at all violates the free speech of cable operators, because now corporations are people, so they have free speech rights too. Um, luckily, the side question was not pursued, and um, the Supreme Court, Court sided with the organization. Um, so that is a threat that has happened but doesn't have any um, adverse effects on us right now. This could come up again. Uh, on the state level, we had a, a lawsuit where Comcast uh, rejected the terms of its CPG renewal in January 2017. Um, some of which were related to carriage of PEG channels, one of which was that would be required to carry our channels on its interactive program guide and to set a pathway to HD channels, and the other was that the state set a goal for line extensions that Comchess wanted to reject. Um, so instead of just paying to do all these things, they paid to go to court instead, and um, ultimately was sent to mediation, and this was recently settled. Uh, those terms are confidential. I can tell you that they were mixed, like any compromise. Um, the terms aren't going to be made public until the Public Utility Commission approves them. And that's because they could reject some of the terms and they could go back to mediation. So you don't want to uh, let anything out. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, uh, Ian asked about when the deadline for the PUC to approve it. I don't know when that is. It should be soon. But there is a deadline? I don't know. It's, it's a docket, so it'll probably just go through the docket system. I, the question because I, wonder if and, oh, sorry. 
I just raised the question in case, you know, is Comcast going to ride this forever so that it stays confidential? It's just annoying that uh, something like a, uh, a public, is this PUC used to be the Public Service Board? Yes. It's now called the Public Utilities Commission. So yeah. it's out of uh, the litigator's hands and it's with the PUC now. Yeah. It, just, it, would, it would annoy me if a public body kept something confidential for very long. Do you follow? Y yes, I, I think that it's just going to move through the system. Yeah, I just time I have wonder if Comcast as a large corporation may favor it taking a long time to move through the system oh, yeah. so that the terms don't become public. Uh, it's a great question. Okay. I just don't know the answer. Thank you. Um, I can tell you, though, how it affects us individually as a station is that our contract renewal with Comcast was up for uh, renewal um, in January, in, in 2017, right about the time of the CPG renewal, and all of our contracts were put on hold um, during the litigation. So we have to wait until that is over till we can renew our contract. Okay, so on to the next one, <laughs> which is the kind of famous one because we've gotten some great coverage from our media partners, the Commons and the Reformer, WVEW, about this issue. Um, just quick wrap up. This is uh, announced last fall. It changes definitions of the 1984 Cable Act. That was the act that established funding for PEG channels from local cable subscribers via a franchise fee. And this new change allows the cable companies to deduct um, the value that they place on in kind services that are required, and so that um, our funding. Um, will be decreased. We don't know by how much. Um, BCTV, the people in this room, the people in this town, the people in the state filed letters in opposition. Ultimately, 10,000 letters were filed, uh, including 45 members of Congress. And this was the most activity on an FCC issue since the net neutrality argument. Um, nevertheless, it passed three to two. Uh, on August 1st, and it goes into effect in a week or so. Um, we'll first see the impact at our quarterly statement in November. And I want to get into this one a little bit just to get, get into what the impact could be. This is, a, um, this is a graph that I shared with you in June just to show um, how reliant BCTV has been on Comcast revenues. This is our, our budget for last the last fiscal year. So you'll see in the lower left-hand corner, revenues without Comcast, $64,000. Um, and this is of a $300,000 budget. What do we spend it on? We spend it on staff and equipment, the basics that we provide to our producers and what we use to make all the programming. Um, response to the threat. Uh, BCTV Board of Directors got together at a retreat in January and took a look at some alternative sources of revenue. Donations, underwriting, uh, production services, and for the first time, uh, talking about having producing membership fees that are set to, the, to match the value somewhat of the services that are being given. Um, so this is very unusual for us. Donations, this is something we have never counted on or never even asked for because we've been using our cable revenues um, to support the station and have not wanted to compete with lo other local nonprofits for donations. So in that way, we've been able to leverage um, the needs of nonprofits with our, um, with our cable revenues. Um, so we'll get into these a little bit more, but uh, you know, it was a very creative session, and some of these things we put into place right away. Um, I know this is a lot of numbers, but I just thought you might be interested to see how we've uh, how it's already had an impact on the bottom line, even within the same fiscal year that we started talking about it. So if you look over on the left, those are our non-Comcast revenue sources. Um, the first column is FY19 as we budgeted it. The next one is FY19 as we ended it. And the next one is a FY20 budget 
based on trying to cover a 30% decline in revenues. That's just a scenario that we picked that is possible. Um, Southern Vermont Cable, hi Mary. Um, we negotiated a new contract with them. It was time to renew the contract and that was for slightly higher revenues. So that has an impact on our bottom line. Uh, donations, as you can see, last year we budgeted $300. You know, just here and there, what people might give. Um, as soon as we put the word out last year at the producer party, we started getting some large, larger donations. So even by the end of that fiscal year, we had a sizable increase. And we're budgeting to try for the same next year. Uh, underwriting is something, as I said at the beginning, we've had some very loyal underwriters. And um, we're going to try and expand that program. That is an ambitious goal, consider, as we all know. Um, this is a town where businesses try to support a lot, a lot of causes. Um, Select board fees. This is something that we have never done before, which was last no December. In response to this, I went to all eight um, towns that we serve and asked for a contribution based on 85 cents per resident in that town. And um, every town agreed to that, um, basically, and we end we're ending up with $15,000 that we didn't have before to support the programming specifically the municipal programming. Um, membership fees, like I talked about, um, FY19 between individual memberships of 10 or $20 and organizational memberships, you know, this is a minimal amount that we are normally, we are used to receiving. Um, and now we are basing our membership fees for both individuals and organizations more on uh, what kind of use a producer wants to and expects to have. Uh, so someone who uses it one time would just pay a one-time fee. Somebody who wants to use it a lot would pay a, a package membership and be able to use unlimited within that. Um, but it, it varies between field production, um, you know, if you just want to edit, if you just want the studio. So um, producers have been very creative, some in um, request, you know, seeking out donations to help cover their fees. That's great. And we're facilitating that. Um, we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure everybody can use BCTV. But for the first time ever, we're having to place a value on the services and the equipment that we're making available. Um, production services. This is something we started doing 10 years ago and um, sort of peaked last year because we had all those Act 46 committees that then turned into other committees and then now they're all down to like three committees so um, <laughs> with consolidation so um, this is probably the level we're going to be at but um, we are adjusting our rates accordingly um, the cable revenues that we have will con continue to subsidize the production services that we do um, but it's it's just we have to be a little bit more careful about what we what we can offer um, and then the final training is sort of a final category is kind of a MISC, or camp fees, training fees. Um, but if you look across the bottom from the, the 64,000 that we talked about at the beginning about budgeted as the non-Comcast revenues, and you can see by FY20, if this goes, if we get to our goal, we will have created a 65% increase um, in non-cable revenues, or non-Comcast cable revenues. Um, even so, that's only a third of the budget. So uh, again, everything depends on how severe the reduction is. Um, but as you can see, um, the board and the staff has dug in and we are, we are preparing um, and doing what we can. Another thing that I did was met with the executive directors of other Southern Vermont stations to talk about uh, the potential for shared services. Um, these are the stations that serve the four counties, the four Southern counties of Vermont. Um, you can see FACT TV in Bellows Falls, SAPA in Springfield, OVTV is um, Okemo Valley TV up in Ludlow. Um, Greater Northern Access TV is in Manchester, and then CAT TV is in Bennington. Um, so um, that, that's just a good 
way of preparing for either cost sharing or savings if, if that is warranted. And then on top of all of that in August, we heard about <laughs> the Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust possibly wanting to purchase this building and turn all these top floors into housing in which case BCTV's office and facilities would be moved to the basement uh, along with the select board meeting room um, and the whatever the equivalent of the Hannah Cosman room would be down there. Um, that is something we is that is currently having a um, feasibility study done and uh, so we'll find out. Um, uh, that's that's all we know right now. Uh, and once that feasibility study is done, we still don't know whether they would go forward with it. So it's at the beginning stages. It's just one of those things that's out there in the wind. People are asking about. I wanted to make sure you knew about it and um, just identify it as some, something that we have to be uh, aware of. Did anything good happen? <laughs> so I could have flip-flopped this, but no. <laughs> Um, the answer is yes, right? <laughs> and um, we had a great year at the Hometown Media Awards. Um, we took home our third overall excellence in PE&G for our budget category. Um, we also had two of our producers win for their productions. Um, I first just want to show you a little clip of the awards submission. It's not the full award submission. It's the... Um, it's just it, 10 seconds of each one of the ones that we submitted. And if you're watching on BCTV, hello from the past. Nice to see you. Hmm. It's pretty good over here. I don't know what it is like right now, but right now, it's pretty good. hundred miles to now that I'm here on a That's another thing is doing something that you don't think you can actually doing do. Doing something that you don't think you can actually do. Yeah. So maybe I should give up on my pole vault. <laughs> The Franklin Farms, David and Mary Ellen Franklin, they are holding the banner. They milk 65 cows in Guilford and so After you calm back down again and you want to start again, you can say, I'm really sorry for what I did that made this escalate the way it did. I'd love to have a better conversation with you. Can we try again? Master has given Dobby a diploma. Dobby is a free elf. <laughs> Although, in all seriousness, I'd like to thank my parents and my siblings and the wonderful Lizzie Hubbard. We think of large-scale assessment as those statewide or national assessments that's given to a large group of students. Primary purpose is to uh, provide feedback on. The reason I was so excited to be a part of the founding of Landmark College was that I am dyslexic. And I'm also a lot older than most of you students. So I was dyslexic before folks really knew what dyslexia was. You made a decision to publicly come out as a transgender woman. How has this experience prepared you for, to be the CEO of Vermont? When I decided to transition, it was for my children. I had three wonderful children. I raised three wonderful Vermonters. Townsend flip-flops it. Uh, one year we do the town, the school district first. And then and the next year we do the town first. And we do that because some people just come for the school. Next question. The opioid crisis affects too many families in our town. And the stigma that's associated with it complicates recovery. Yeah. yeah. So did we do like one submission with all these shows? Yes. So is that available online or anything? Yes, it is. Um, I, uh, it's on our website if you s search under awards. Yeah, um, so it's, the rules are you have to submit eight minutes, eight unedited minutes excerpt, 
or if something's short, the whole thing. Shorter than that, the whole thing. Um, so it's hard to find eight minutes of something with no audio or video problems. <laughs> and that's interesting. Okay. Anyway, um, and part of what we were submitting was things about Vermont, things about our that were, you know, intrinsic to our area. So um, anyway, it's good. We they got a good response. Uh, the other award that was received was Jennifer Latham's video that she produced for the Brattleboro Conservation Commission, How to Identify Japanese Knotweed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that one in the category Best of Instructional and Training. And just to give you a little taste of that. Driving around southern Vermont, you have probably seen Japanese knotweed, even if you didn't know what it was. In our first video, we told you why it's important to control it. Now, we'll show you how to identify this plant at a glance. So this is Japanese knotweed. Okay, you got the idea. <laughs> uh, and then uh, producer Derek Jordan's show, The World Fusion Show, which he's been producing for two years here in the studio. Uh, won the Best Entertainment and Art Series for an independent producer. And again, this is a national award. Um, this show, he is promoted and has almost 100 public access stations across the country airing this show on a regular basis, um, which is really quite a feat. And i um, also going to give you a little piece of the awards clip. We share the happy and good Good life. Nyokobak. Nyokobak, yeah. Yeah, it's great. I know. That's great. I think I could play the drum with that guy. <laughs> Um, the other good thing that happened this year is we had a lot of amazing interns. We had Vlasta's niece here, uh, Martina, for a month, and she did some archiving and helped out with video camp. We had uh, Mycroft Stone, who was a BUHS student, and he made the front page of the Reformer um, because he was headed up, he's headed off to film school in London, and um, uh, you know got a lot out of his internship with us. We had more kids from BUHS. We had uh, Hilltop Montessori School. We had some college students coming back from their first year away who had been interns. Um, and we had um, Alex Evans, who's down there to the right, um, who was a Landmark College intern who produced his own show. Basically, he produced the radio show at Landmark College and then edited a BCTV, so then it was up on YouTube. Um, and we often give interns the option, you know, that you can help us out editing what we need help with, or you can make something that you want to make. Um, and he's one of the first people who really took advantage of that. Uh, we also, I put Austin in there because he w learned how to, uh, to um, direct the Brattleboro Select Board. <laughs> Big milestone. Yeah. Um, we also had happen we our news show Green Mountain Mornings Tonight, which was a video cast of <laughs> of the radio show Green Mountain Mornings. Um, that was canceled at the end of 2018 by KPT. Um, but to the rescue came WTSA News. Uh, a month later, uh, Ian Kelly started uploading his uh, morning morning newscast that we now show at noon on BCTV. So we still have a local media radio news show on BCTV as our news show, um, which we're really happy about. And just finally, um, in your annual report, you'll see a lot of numbers, but overall it was a great year for content, 1,200 hours of new local content, 1,300 new shows. Channel 8 is primarily produced by volunteers. Channel 10 by staff, that's more of the meetings, um, but there is some of each. Uh, our YouTube channel gets 850 views a day. Uh, that adds up to over 300,000 views during the course of a year. We have a lot of videos up there now after all these years. Um, and the website, um, 
less so, but it's still active. Um, one thing I talked about last year was that we had purchased uh, asset management software so that when somebody uses, uh, checks out something from BCTV, uses the studio, uses the edit suite, that is um, recorded in the software. And those of you who are using our stuff have been signing sign out sheets that come from a software package instead of just handwritten. Um, and that resulted in knowing that we had 2,000 uses this year. Um, and uh, so that's about eight uses every day we are open. Uh, uh, one use being somebody checking out gear or using the edit suite or using the studio. Um, so that's a high number considering that we're a small station and one of the reasons that the numbers of shows and numbers of hours that we produce every year are as high as much larger stations. So again, it's not very many people doing a lot, <laughs> which would be our tagline if it sounded better. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not, not, not what you want from a tagline, right? Um, What's on the horizon? We have our producer awards party coming up. And that is going to be um, in October. And um, this is the party part. <laughs> um, whereas this meeting is more about member a business, the business of the organization. This is all about celebrating our producers and what they do. And um, really hope to see all of you there. That's going to be Thursday, October 24th at 118 Elliott. There'll be another People's Choice Award amongst the top viewed videos. And uh, the reason that we have it at this time of year is that October 20th is National Community Media Day. And so we try and have it on the Thursday closest to that. And, um, and because of that, we have also been working on a Community Media Day video, which Brian is going to preview for you now. Wow. wow. Yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions about anything, either in everything I presented or in the annual report, um, I can answer right now or later. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a long history here. I'm yes, you do, Ian. Technically an employee. Um, my son had a wonderful opportunity. He had just reached the age where he qualifies for the BCTV summer camp. And thankfully, you folks let in enough kids. And I know this is probably a very small thing on the revenue side, and it's also a very uh, intensive time for your staff to run the summer camp. But I would, put, I would wholeheartedly and in public advocate maybe the idea of having two summer camps in one year, like maybe one week apiece, so that more kids, because it seems like that camp has, very, uh, has a big draw and I think it has a huge uh, oversized impact because I know that my son was very uh, impressed by your uh, facilities and, and, and yes, and, and the, all the camp counselors. So it's just, that's a small thing I would like no, you to consider. Great, great the idea suggestion. of actually expanding your camp because I think it's a huge, it, it reaches an audience that's quite young. Yeah. But those kids are uh, very media savvy, many of them, so. I, I would just say advocate that think about that, maybe a little expansion of that so more kids can take advantage of it. Thanks. Great, great, Ian. Good point. Uh, anybody else, any comments on all of that good news? <laughs> um, okay, so Brian, should we turn off lights for this? Yeah, or? turn it off. Do I need your phone to turn that off? Oh, you want to turn that off too? <laughs> no, or you can, you can come and talk if you want. I was just going to say a few things quickly. Yeah, go. Obviously, this has been a big year for public access, good and bad. Uh, so this year for Community uh, Media Day video, which is Community Media Days in October, right, Cor? October 20th. October 20th. So usually around this time, we get together and we discuss what kind of video we, we want to do for that. Usually preview it at our annual meeting, which is tonight. And then we make some adjustments going forward. Um, so this year, we had some found footage of some representatives, both at the state level and national level, kind of discussing the value of public access and also the threats um, that could be you know, coming in the future. So that's pretty much all I have to say. You can watch this, see if I can turn off this light. Nope. Yep. Oh, cool. All right, let's see if this works.
We know that so many of our constituents get information from BCTV. It's incredible how many people will stop me on the street and say, I saw that interview or I saw that uh, select board meeting. What I love about the public access televisions is people feel authorized to get on there and say their piece. They have access to a public forum where their words get disseminated. And it's so core to democracy for people to feel empowered to speak and to be heard. You provide that. It's a way to let people in the community participate in public dialogue. They can do it by watching, but they can also do it by participating. I mean, the opportunities that local people have to, to speak to their neighbors on public access television is enormous. But the fact that uh, school board meetings or select board meetings are broadcast and then people talk about it, that is really important. We are in a situation where public access TV stations all around Vermont may lose a considerable amount of funding. There's an assault on the public good, you know, the common. There are certain things that we just as a society have to decide that we share, that we're in it together and we have to have a system of funding where the objective of the service to the public can be viable. We've just got to have that if we're going to kind of revitalize our democracy. By the way, I've been to a lot of your cable stations. You're not living large, <laughs> so you do a lot with a little. <laughs> And I really appreciate that. It's one of the big challenges we have in this country right now. Public community engagement. We need more of, not less of. There has to be some uh, contribution to public access for the purposes of letting the public participate and benefit in the democratic dialogue. And that's what you guys do all around the state. I'm recording. I'm recording. Great stuff, Brian. Nice job. Nice job, everybody. BCTV. Yeah. Well, we're fortunate that, that folks like our members of Congress who we reached out to get it, get what we do, and get, get the value of it, and have been supportive of this. And really, all across all local, state, uh, government, as well as uh, members of Congress uh, have been really supportive. And, and you all, too, as members, as volunteers, as employees, have been really uh, supportive as well. I mean, Core talked a little bit about the bad news of things, but I remember that meeting here in June, and um, I was really heartened after that meeting as how people received the news, how people understood it, and how people weren't willing to just go gentle into that good night. And I mean, that really means a lot to us as board members. That's what we take into account when we make the decisions that we make uh, to do the things that we do. Um, want to let you know that in addition to any comments you want to make tonight, our board meetings are always open and you're always welcome to come. Uh, they're typically on the on this day, right? The third Wednesday of, of every month. And um, she, uh, Core, posts the schedule frequently. I know some of you here in this room have taken advantage of that and want to encourage others of you uh, to do so as well. It's always great to hear uh, from the folks in the community about what's important to them and how we can support all the things that you do to make this station great. Um, with that said, are there other comments that, that people want to make tonight or, or questions that I can turn over to Core? <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, could you use the microphone, oh, please? Yeah. I have a question about those of us who are producing our own shows and are on the air, you know, either weekly or bi week or, you know, a couple times a month or monthly. Um, we have room, I certainly have room in my show to talk about what's happening with the FCC. Um, but I would like to be able to give the audience like a 20 second sound bite so that that's understandable and so that they know 
in my credits I have you can make donations and there's the trail but this is something that you know my show is weekly and so that message goes out every week right well it goes out daily so um, I would like to have more of a succinct message to give to my viewers yeah that's a great comment like a clip that you can no attach. not a no not a clip just you know when I'm intro before I introduce someone you know, like when, um, for instance, when Aiden left, you know, I gave him a shout out. And I've mentioned, you know, what we're doing now, but I feel like um, the audience needs updates. And that would be a great way to get the word out. Yeah, that's that's a, a really great point. I can say that we've been trying to work towards more messaging that we can provide on the channels and on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some of this has been a bit of a moving target mm -hmm. <laughs> as we right. wait for the FCC to rule. But now that we right. have a little more clarity around that, I think that would be a really useful thing to provide. So, and I think giving suggestion. an update weekly is mm -hmm. a really great idea. Yeah. And the, we have the venues. We have many venues available for that. Yeah. So maybe, again, more communication mm -hmm. between um, you know what what the messages are what's ha what's happening this week with the FCC right you know what would our viewer, viewers like to know about because that way they can be much more engaged and mm -hmm. therefore they're going to watch more TV and they're going to you know donate money yeah well and you bring up the, the say something succinct in 20 seconds on a couple of these different sure. news stories that come out I've had uh, members of the media reach out to me just what exactly does this mean? That's what does right. this say? And you know, I try to uh, piece through it with them. And I'm sure, Corey, you've probably had similar conversations and maybe other board members as well. Yeah. But, but yeah, I think I think we can do something like that. Great suggestion. Thank you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other comments, suggestions, questions tonight? No? I think the only other piece of business we have to do is announce the election results. There you go. There are, oh, there are no questions from, from Facebook streaming? Anything? No, there hasn't no, been? Okay. Okay, great. Um, well, Alex Beck was running on a post, so unless there was a serious write-in uh, for somebody's pet or something like that, uh, I think uh, we're probably safe to say that Alex is uh, going to continue to stay with us for another three-year term. I'm going to call the election now, right? I'm allowed to do that. All right. Great. And I guess uh, with that, uh, this annual meeting is adjourned. Uh, Thanks once again to everybody coming out. Uh, hope to see you in October uh, for the Producer Awards. Be great to have you there. And we all get to have some fun at 118 Elliott. All right. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody at home. Thank you.